walking in grace. Walking in grace. Now I heard about a man who really loved dogs. What did I say? A man who loved dogs. And he was so devoted to these dogs that he would study about them. He would even go around and he would give talks to those who love dogs and who are owners of dogs. One day he decided to pour a new sidewalk in front of his house. Now his neighbor watched from his window as he smoothed out the last square foot of cement. Just then a large dog appeared and walked through the fresh cement. Leaving paw prints behind. The man muttered something under his breath and he just went by smoothly. He smoothed out the damage. Lo and behold, he then went inside to get some twine so he could put up a fence around the sidewalk. But brothers and sisters, when he got back outside, he discovered that some more dark tracks were there in his fresh cement. So he smoothed out the cement and put up the fence. He then went into the house again. Five minutes later, he looked outside and he saw some more paw prints. And so this man was really mad now. Couldn't take it anymore. He got out of his, he got out his shovel and he smoothed the cement one more time. As he got back into the porch, the dog reappeared and he sat right in the middle of the sidewalk. And so this man came to his peak. He could not take it any longer. And he went inside, he grabbed his gun, and he shot the dog dead. Oh yes, he's a dog lover. <laughs> now brethren, the neighbor rushed over and he said, uh, Why did you do such an evil thing? I thought that you loved dogs. And the man thought for a minute and said, of course I do. I do like dogs, but that's in the abstract. I love dogs in the theory, but I hate dogs in the concrete. I'm glad that you got it. Because brothers and sisters, as we look at that story, we recognize that many of us feel about our theme today about grace for, the, for this morning, we, we think about the same thing when we think of grace. Oh yes, we would talk about grace, we would read about grace, we would say that we have grace and we would extend grace. But when it comes concrete, my friends, when it comes to a place where each one of us as brothers and sisters would have to apply grace to others, it often seems difficult. And so we love to hear about forgiveness in the abstract. But when it comes close home, we hate it in the concrete. And so amazing grace shall always be my song of praise, the writer says. For it was grace that brought me liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever, the writer says, lift my eyes to Calvary. Because brothers and sisters, it is at Calvary, it is as we look at the life of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for all of us on the cross. It is there we can find and say, hey, we can find grace in Jesus. And so to view the cross where Jesus died for me, how marvelous the grace that caught my fallen soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. And so today we talk about it. We sing about it. We say it's amazing. And we even name our churches and our children after it. Grace is one of the most powerful names. But yet it's popular. And, uh, but what is grace this morning? One may ask once there was a little boy and a preacher who was visiting his mother that afternoon. She had known the preacher was coming and had made some cookies. So that while they are there they would eat the cookies 
Of course, that made the little boy very happy and he was eating away at those cookies while the grown-ups were there talking. Then he came to the last cookie, but as he was getting ready to put the cookie in his mouth, it dropped to the ground. And well, he was not going to let a perfectly cooked a cookie away, so he picked it up. And he was going to eat it, but his mother stopped him and said, don't eat that. It has germs on it. And so the little boy in frustration, he was so hungry, he stomped his feet and he said, germs and Jesus, germs and Jesus, that's all I ever hear. I ain't never seen any of them. Brothers and sisters, we are going to talk about it. But if we are going to talk about it, we need a good working definition. We should know what it's looked like, what, what grace actually looks like. So the dictionary definition of grace is unmerited, divine assistance given for justification, regeneration, or sanctification. That says a whole lot. You see, it is a free gift that is not earned or purchased. There is nothing that you and I can do this morning to earn God's grace and his mercy. It's a free gift. And all we got to do is appreciate and accept the gift. It comes from God and it enables us to, to be saved and to grow in faith day after day. So that definition is fine and good. But what does that look like in real life? If you and I want to have relationship that lasts for a long haul, then we must be willing to extend forgiveness to others. Here's another way to say it. In every relationship you have, you will constantly be called on to forgive and to ask others for forgiveness. And so forgiveness is costly. It's not easy to ask for forgiveness. And it's certainly not easy to extend forgiveness to those who would have wronged us. Those who would have hurt us. Those who would have done things to us. That we know for a fact that it is not good. It is hurting us deep within our hearts. But this morning, friends, if each one of us is going to be forgiven by God, if we are going to be forgiven and we would have a place in his eternal kingdom, we must be able to forgive others. And so in Proverbs 18, 19, he says that an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city. And disputes are like the bad gates of a citadel. And so friends, forgiveness is the virtue we most enjoy and least employ. Oh yes, we love to be forgiven. When we have done wrong, we are quick to say, forgive me. But when others do wrong to us, it seems so difficult to extend that same grace. And so forgiveness is the virtue we most enjoy. Forgiveness is not natural and that's why it is so hard to do. Forgiveness is not fair. Our sense of justice wants to be vindicated. You see, when others do us wrong, friends, we don't think that it is fair for them to hurt us. And so we want to hurt them back. We want to ensure that they pay for every hurt that they would have done. And so of all the people in the Bible this morning, Peter, as we look at our scripture reading, he stands out as the most mathematical of the disciples. You see, he was a stickler for detail, always trying to pin down the precise meaning of everything that Jesus said. Do you remember when Jesus engineered a miraculous catch of fish? It was Peter who sat down. He counted each squirm in one to find out uh, that they caught, how much they would have caught that day. And if you were to take your Bible and count the number of times that Peter messed up in his life, uh, brothers and sisters will understand that he would, we would discover that he needed forgiveness from Jesus even about seven times. And so being a numbers guy, one day Peter came up to Jesus. He asked him a question in Matthew uh, chapter 18, 21. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? A brother who keep and consistently uh, just keep hurting me and doing me harm. How much times must I extend forgiveness to this guy? And so Peter was trying to discover a mathematical formula for grace. 
When you think about it, we all have some barriers that keep us from giving the gift of forgiveness to others. We have a threshold that we don't want to cross at times, a limit that we won't go beyond. And so our brothers, our sisters, our parents may have done us wrong. Our teachers at school would have done us some harm. And friends, brothers and sisters, we are there trying to find out how much uh, should we actually forgive them after they would have come commit these acts over and over again. And so I can think of at least three barriers of an unforgiving heart today. Number one, revenge. I'm going to get even. You have done this to me and I'm going to ensure that I do the same thing to you or even worse. Then we have resentment. I'm going to stay angry for the rest of my life. And so my father rejected me. He neglected me for many years. And up to this day, I'm an adult and I'm still not hearing from him, but uh, if he is about to come into my heart, I'm going to continue uh, holding on to those hurt, those hurt for the rest of my life. I'll never forgive him. And then remembering is another barrier. I'll never forget it. And so we've all asked this question at one time or another. How many times I have to forgive this guy? I'm getting tired of it. What does he keep? Why does he keep hurting me all the time? We've asked this question. But this same person did something to hurt him. I believe to Peter the next day. Peter forgave that individual. A couple of days later his friend lied to him. This time Peter reluctantly forgave him. But now he's ticked off. And so Peter wanted Jesus to help him set some forgiveness limits. And so Peter wanted uh, to know when it's okay to say that shit. When it's okay to cut that person off. You've messed up uh, one too many times, Peter would have thought. And so I wonder if Peter here is thinking of someone, his literal brother, maybe Andrew. You see, maybe Andrew didn't uh, put the fishnets away. Or maybe he's always borrowing Peter's old navy jacket. Uh, maybe he borrowed some uh, shekels for some uh, shalupas at the Chinese restaurant. For some reason he didn't pay Peter back. Whatever the case before Jesus could answer. Peter responded to his own question. Suggesting to Jesus seven times probably is enough. And so the rabbis back then told that you had to forgive someone three times. And then you could retaliate. And so the fourth time you could do whatever you liked. In fact they mistakenly taught that God only forgives three times. And so Peter doubled that and he added one for good measure. I think he thought his answer would impress Jesus. But to be honest, forgiving someone seven times is commendable. I mean, I mean uh, imagine your friend. Imagine someone just coming and they're hurting you, hurting you, they're saying and doing things that are hurting you over and over. I mean, isn't seven times enough? I believe seven is a lot. Most of us would get frustrated if we have to forgive someone twice. By human standards, what Peter said was admirable and perhaps even extravagant because Peter wanted a number. He wanted a limit, a place where he could finally say, that's it, you're not going to get away anymore. And so as Jesus often does, the answer to Peter was unexpected. And disarming, take a look at verse 22. I tell you, the scripture said, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. And so the question you hear is Peter hitting the ground in a dead faint. Can you imagine Peter there thinking of seven times? And now Jesus is saying 70 times, seven. 70 times 7, he got out his pocket calculator and, and he punched in, I could imagine, the numbers. And, and so friends, as you are punching 70 times 7, how much is that? The mathematicians. What's that? 490, very good. But 400, and, I mean, 7 times just isn't suggesting that we count the number of times we forgive someone. Uh, 298, and the person comes again. 299, uh, 300, and uh, only 190 to go. Not at all. I heard of 
the story of a man one day who asked his wife to forgive him for something he did. And before she could answer, he reminded her that Jesus wanted her to forgive 490 times. And so she laughed and said, buddy, you're already over 500. But she said, I'll forgive you anyway. You see, 70 times 7 means there is no limit to the number of times that you are to forgive someone. Actually, if you were to count, by the time you reach 490, you would be in the habit of continual un unlimited forgiveness. And so you might as well continue to forgive. And so that's precisely the point Jesus is making. You don't keep score when it comes to forgiveness. It doesn't matter what the friend did to you. It doesn't matter what your husband or your wife did, for, did to you. Over and over, friends, don't count the amount of times you must forgive. But forgive him or her anyway. So we're talking about walking in grace. You say, like grace, brothers and sisters, forgiveness has about its maddening quality because it is undeserved, it's unmerited, and it's unfair. We don't deserve it. But God expects us still to forgive. And so understand that freedom from hurt and anger comes only through complete forgiveness. I thought you hear Amen. But some of us this morning are very angry and bitter. Oh yes, we are angry. We are not speaking to the brother or sister next to us. As close as that. Can't stand a brother or sister for all sorts of petty reasons. Wrong that was done to us years ago, we are still holding on to it. Saying that we are not going to forgive and some business transaction that may have gone wrong with you and a brother or sister. And we are just going to keep on keeping on. I mean, some of us this morning are haters. Oh yes, it's a popular word now that we use. We are haters because of difference in political affiliation. Oh, I, I, I know I wouldn't hear amen. It is true and we don't realize that it is what's eating away the progress of the church. I mean, we hate a brother or sister just because a, 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 a person have a different persuasion to you. And so you decide that you're not going to like this individual. You're not going to have anything to do with this individual. It's not the way of God. We can't see eye to eye with our brothers and sisters yet. We are thinking of going to Zion. Oh yes, we are singing, we are marching to Zion and are thinking that all of us are on the road to heaven. But yet we can't forgive our brother and sister. And so we are quick to speak forgiveness. But in reality, we are not extending it to others. For a Christian brothers and sisters to be unwilling to forgive is unthinkable. Can't be a Christian and not, don't forgive. And so, Scripture plainly commands us to forgive in the same manner as we have received forgiveness. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Uh, just as God in Christ also has forgiven us. If Jesus didn't forgive some of us this morning. If he hasn't extended his grace and his mercy to some of us. We don't know where we would be this morning. And so I'm thankful this morning that it is free. I'm thankful this morning that we don't have to pay because I believe this morning, friends, I would be doomed. Oh yes, I don't have money to buy. But I thank God for Jesus. And so since God commands us to forgive others, refusing to do so is an act of direct disobedience. If we continue not to forgive, we might as well forget about heaven. And so then there are some of us who hate just for spite. Oh yes, we just look at a person. I can't understand it, but we just look at a person and we hate them for nothing. When this happens, it's a demonic spirit that is taking charge of that person. Because friends, it cannot be the spirit of God. It must be something opposite to the spirit of God. 
And it's a trick of the devil to think or uh, uh, make us think that we can, yes, we can hold those things in our hearts, the hurt and the pain and not forgive, but know that we are still on our way, on our way to heaven. Certainly it is more frequently found in the open among the people of God than the sins we typically regard as heinous. But scripture is clear that God despises an unforgiving spirit. And so as God's children, we are to mirror his character. At salvation, we are given a new nature that bears God's spiritual likeness. So forgiveness is an integral part of the Christian's new nature. An unforgiving Christian is a contradiction in turn. Yet to face the issue squarely, we must all admit this morning, brothers and sisters, that forgiveness does not come easily. Even as Christians, we would struggle, my friends, because I must say to us in the spirit, my friends, that hey, sometimes men and women, sometimes our brothers, sometimes those who are closest to us can do some devious things to us. Oh yes, they can backbite us, they can say some evils against us this morning. And so it's not easy for us to forgive. But friends, with Jesus in the vessel. Oh yes, with Jesus in the verse, when, when Jesus is in the life of a believer, then it becomes, my friends, are possible to forgive. And so Paul is a living example of grace this morning. Paul, the great apostle, we know this story well. To the Gentiles, he was preaching the, the writer of half the New Testament. Was not always a servant of Jesus Christ. Because the first time we meet Paul in the Bible, friends, he's participating in the stoning of Stephen. Stephen's crime was that he declared that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the first Christian martyr. Uh, later Paul gets indictments to imprison any believer, any person who claimed that they believe in Jesus. Uh, Paul was given the mandate to get rid of them. And so one day Paul was on his way to the city of Damascus. There he must have been thinking how many individuals he was going to arrest that day. But then suddenly Jesus appeared to him, friends on the road, in a light from heaven. Jesus said, oh, why do you persecute me? Many times in our lives, my friends, uh, we think that we are doing things in the name of Jesus. Uh, and so sometimes we would hate individuals. Sometimes we would do things that are wrong, friends, uh, and think that we are doing it in the name of Jesus. Uh, uh, thinking that God is well pleased. With our behavior. And so many times we find excuses. And we say well. God speaks to the brother and sister. The spirit would have been with him. And so if he is caught in a wrong. Or uh, uh, something I would not say anything to him. Because he knows better. But God expects us my friends to tell them. Paul was going on his way, going at his business, thinking that he was going to persecute friends. But Jesus stopped him on the way. He was struck blind, but after a few days, God sent a Christian to Paul to open his eyes and to tell him the good news of Jesus Christ. It was only after this life-changing experience that Paul became the champion of the gospel that we know him as today. And today, if we apply the same thing in our lives, if we allow Jesus to come into our life, friends, uh, we would extend grace, we would extend forgiveness to others, uh, and we, we, my friends, would spread the good news also of Jesus Christ. God could have given up on Paul, my friends. Jesus had every right to take Paul's life, just as Stephen's life was, was taken. But I thank God for grace. I thank God for Jesus. I thank God today that Jesus is not like us. Because friends, we would kill and we would get rid of so many individuals if you were in the place of Jesus. But I thank God we are not him. In fact, God's grace went even farther in the life of Paul. Paul was called to be one who take the good news of Jesus Christ beyond Israel and to all nations of the Lord by the Spirit to lead thousands of Christ, thousands to Christians to start churches and to write letters that still inspire Christians today. Some of us even take it further and apply unforgiveness and malice to the cause of God. 
Oh yes, we give up our offices in church because we don't agree with something or someone. Someone thinking that we are hurting the person. But the truth is a lot of us, my friends, often give up at the cross. And there is where pain is, my friends. You see, when you go at the cross and you stay at the cross, at the cross, there is pain at the cross, my friends. There is trouble and problems on every side. But when you pass, my friend, go past the cross this morning. And you will find peace. You will find joy this morning. And so that's what Paul is talking about when he says, Though I formerly blaspheme and persecute and insult, but I receive mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul is a living example of grace today. By grace he was saved from a life of hatred. He was set free to love. He was given more than a second chance my friends. And Paul was given an opportunity to make up for all the persecuting persecution that he would have done and so God gave each of us a soul that was beautiful but we go and we make a mess of it God could have said you made your mess now lie in it and live in it you messed up what I gave you by sinning you don't deserve to have a righteous life but it said God said here is a new life my brother my sister here is a new life my son my daughter instead of denying us the righteousness we need Jesus said here is my righteousness then he died on a cross for our sins we didn't deserve it friends we had made a mess of what God had given us but God gives us a new life today thank you Jesus hear what Ellen White says nothing she says, can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not partake of God's pardoning grace. And so she says in God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. Uh, that tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and for him to the souls of others, that tenderness and the mercy that Christ has revealed in his own life will be seen in those who become shearers of his grace. But Romans 8, 9 says, But if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so he's alienated from God, fitted only for eternal separation from God. So as we... Seek to close this morning. As we look at grace, as we look at the standard of grace, as we seek to walk in grace, brothers and sisters, I am reminded of the life of John Newton, uh, which is a living example of grace. John Newton was a captain of a slave ship. A lot of people are not aware of the hours and uh, the slave trade, my friend. The crossing from Africa was perhaps the most deadly part of the slave trade. The newly enslaved Africans were treated like cargo. They were packed in as closely as possible. Many died and their bodies were unceremoniously thrown overboard. The shipping company considered them acceptable losses. But friends, when John Newton, when he's there and realized his sin, he saw himself as he really was. He was a man with the blood of thousands on his hands. He was responsible for causing many to die. But friends, he lived in an age when many had these same bloodstains on their hands. But God forgave him. God forgave this man and by the blood of Christ he was washed clean this morning friends didn't deserve it but God but God my friends God gave that forgiveness by grace in praise to God he wrote a well known song perhaps you have heard it perhaps you would have sung it many times it says amazing grace how sweet the song that save a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see. Oh thank God for his amazing grace. God's grace is amazing. 
And so this morning, friends, as we come to a close, as we look at the cross, as we look at what Jesus uh, would have done for us on the cross of Calvary, and as the organist played that wonderful song, Amazing Grace, uh, I just wanted to take some time this morning, friends, uh, uh, take a brief moment and uh, look to Jesus. Uh, look to the one who has given us amazing grace. Uh, look to the one who has extended his arms day after day when we would have turned our backs on him, uh, when we would have done the wrong to him, friends. Uh, uh, Jesus look at us and we recognize that still we can have his redemption we can have his pardon 108 and so friends as we think about that grace this morning as we think about the sacrifice and as you look at your own life this morning hasn't it, hasn't it not been for grace this morning what your life would be think about this this morning uh, think about Jesus in your life today and what it would be like this morning if he didn't come to rescue you Oh, we took a wretch like John Newton and used him to write a song to inspire many. It took a murderer like Paul and used him to lead a world of sinners to salvation. And it has taken us sinners, friends. Taken us wretch this morning that we are and given us new life. That is my definition of grace this morning. It's a life, friends, undeserving. It's a life that would have gone to the roots, but because of the blood and the grace of Jesus. Today we can say we have a Savior. Today we can say we have a man in the name of Christ Jesus who is able Able to save us, able to restore us, able to give us a new life in Jesus Christ. Oh friends, grace is not about the pastor this morning. Grace is not about the elders. Grace is not about the brother or sister. Grace is about Jesus Christ. And if Jesus is in the life this morning, then grace is your business today. Oh, are you in need today? Do you need a fresh anointing do you need a fresh portion of his grace today for Christ's sake brothers and sisters let go of what you are holding against your brother or sister this morning there may be something that you're holding there, there is something that is just there and it's lingering it's causing barrier between you and the brother between you and the sister but friends if it is causing a barrier between you and the brother and sister then it's causing a barrier also between you and Jesus. As I make things right this morning. Commit your life to Jesus. If you know. For Christ's sake this morning. That you have a problem with a brother or sister. You have something that they would have done to you. Some, uh, some years ago. Uh, some days or weeks ago. But yet you are lingering. You are holding it in your heart. Today is a time to make it right. We can't give an account for tomorrow. Or we don't hold tomorrow. This is the very moment, the only time that we have on our hands to do anything in this life is this very present moment. Because there's no guarantee that any one of us would leave the building this morning. There's no guarantee that we'll reach our home this morning. There's no guarantee that any one of us this morning would see tomorrow. And so the wisest thing for each one of us to do this morning is to recommit and ensure that our lives are where God wants it to be. This morning I need the grace of God. Oh yes, my life, my life without it would be a wreck. This morning I would be nothing without it. And so daily I need the grace of God. If there's just one brother, one sister this morning who needs the grace of God. You need to recommit your life to Jesus. You need the grace of God to flow and to fill your life this morning. If that is your desire today, I ask you to stand with me today. Won't you stand with Jesus? Take a stand for Jesus. Oh, his grace is able. We are to release every malice, every form of hatred, every form of anger this morning and allow the spirit of God to saturate our hearts, saturate our minds so that we can live victoriously for Jesus.